We are back live to talk about Alita exceeding expectations at the box office. On top of that, we get to see Taron Egerton sing in a new featurette for Rocketman. And on top of that, what is with this whole Army Hammer Batman rumor? Is it the real deal? No, it's not. And we're going to discuss that right here on Collider Movie Talk. Well, that's that. Hello, everybody. Always taking care of business on this set, not letting rumors go out there running rampant. I am Perry Nemroff. I'm super happy to be here with Haley Fowler. Ouch, and John Roca. Hello. How are you guys doing today? Happy to be back. Yes. Happy to be back right before you leave us again. Yeah, taking off for a little bit, uh, going overseas there across the pond. But yes, enjoyed the three day uh, break, but I'm tired as hell. We spent all weekend buying furniture and putting it in the place. So there was a lot of building and lifting and carrying, and I'm exhausted and I can't wait to relax. Rough so. life. Rough life. Yeah, rough. It's a rough <laughs> life, but you know. Well, it's not as rough as expected for Alita, which actually exceeded box office expectations, but of course it came at a pretty uh, hefty price tag there. So who knows if it's actually going to pay off in the end, but Alita led the pack this holiday weekend with $27.8 million for the three-day weekend. Happy Death Day to you, on the other hand, fell way short, and it only opened with $9.5 million, but of course that one has a much smaller production budget, a mere $9 million, so it already earned that back, which is a good thing. As for Isn't It Romantic, that one did take advantage of the holiday, and it wound up coming in with $14.3 million. Roca, mm. let's start with Alita first. Yeah. So it did take a nice chunk of cash over the weekend, sure. and I think that is a sign that it was a smart move to move the release date from December to February. Yeah. But the big question now, is it with that enormous price tag, is it still kind of a lost cause? Does it have any chance of breaking even? I don't think it is. I mean, $500 million is what they're estimating for it to break even, and that's almost impossible, I think, at this point, especially even overseas with some Asian markets that's still yet to open with the film. Uh, I think they'll get a nice box office there. But we said this on the show. Yes, it exceeded expectations, which is great, but we knew it had to make at least $100 million to make a dent in what it has to do to break even. Um, 41 whatever it was, is nice for it, and maybe it'll grow from that. It's a shame we probably won't get a sequel because I think there was a lot of effort done to make this one of the most visually incredible films I've, we've seen in a while. Unfortunately, the story lacked and that's where you're seeing uh, some of the issues with people going to see this movie or recommending this movie and going to see it. And this is a tough one anyway. This is a tough one to enter into, to get into and see like Valerian and these other films that have got mortal engines. Like they're tough sci-fi films or fantasy films to get people to come see. So you've got to really find some kind of hook. I think if the story was as strong as the special effects, I think people would have come to see this at higher numbers. It's a frustrating double-edged sword because I want to sit here and applaud something that takes such big risks and mm. has technical innovations that we can all admire, but at the same time, you do have to plan for the future and for the inevitable if you spend that much. So, did you get the chance to catch it this weekend, Haley? I did not. But no. you did see a certain other movie. I did, yes. We are two of very few, apparently, who saw <laughs> Happy know. Death Day to you. <laughs> So I've spent way too much time the past 48 hours trying to figure out what the heck happened with Happy Death Day to You because I was looking at those early projections leading up to the release and I know a lot of times when we're talking about long range projections, everybody tends to roll their eyes. Oh, they always change. They're always wrong. Yes, but that can happen. But at the time that those projections are reported, it's coming from data. It's coming from surveys and all these other different paid services that are out there professionally collecting information and of course as you get closer to releases that does change but with Happy Death Day in particular it seemed like the studio projections and everything it, they were all falling in the same range and it made so much sense to me considering how much the first one made and then like I don't even think it earned half uh, half of what the first one made no it didn't uh, in the first again and it I I'm so sad. Please go see it if you haven't and you like these types of movies because they want to make a third one and I very much want them to do that. I, I think that maybe I'm with you where I've been trying to figure out why this happened. I think maybe part of it might have been a marketing thing because they kept mm. so much of what the second movie was a secret, I feel like, that maybe it just looked a little too much like the first one in the trailers. Which is crazy because that's exactly why... I like it so much because it's not that. 
Right. It goes, it does embrace what the original one is, but it also embraces that whole Back to the Future yeah. idea and the comedy way more than I ever expected. And I think it's super cool that we got a sequel that's so drastically different from the original. I, I really like it. And I, I think that maybe they messed up a little bit not selling that element of it, not selling how extremely fun it is and how different and surprising of a sequel it is. I there's no other real reason I can think of why this would have happened because it was it was a slightly crowded box office, but everything underperformed. Isn't it like the worst mm -hmm. weekend in 15 years for that mm -hmm. holiday? Yes, so I think it says it was for the three-day President's Day weekend, all top 12 contenders made a combined almost $110 million, and that does make it the worst three-day President's Day weekend since 2004. Right, so it's not like it had the hardest competition to get by mm. and also I would say that the films that it was facing weren't especially targeting the same audience mm -hmm. overtly you know in the way that some head to head showdowns can. and also after the prodigy underperformed as well yeah. I thought there was going to be you know there was going to be a void that needed to be filled in terms of folks out there who were eager to see a new horror movie I'm just very surprised and very very saddened by it and I uh the lovely Christopher Landon tweeted like, doesn't always work out at the box office, but I was happy to make this movie and it's always a gift. And my hope is that uh, because the budget was so low and it will earn more than this first weekend, obviously, that maybe Blumhouse, because they're so smart about their budgeting, will be able to pull, pull out a small budgeted third one just to wrap up that trilogy. I really do hope so. Hmm. Looking back over all of the weekends that we've seen thus far in 2019, because it has been a very weak start to the year, do you guys attribute that to anything specifically, or are we just talking about the major lack right now? Because at this point last year, we had Black Panther, which obviously was mm. a phenomenal box office success. Or, I mean, is there something else at work right now? Well, this was fun sitting on the Collider Witching Hour set to talk about Happy Death Day to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I will say this. I, I, I was shocked about it, too. It was fun following you guys' tweets. The desperate, You guys weren't the only ones. A lot of people who were desperate to get people in the theaters to see this movie and, and, and punch up this movie. And so it is a shame that it, it, it didn't quite catch on as much as people might think. But you never know. You never know, as you guys said. I will say this, though. The box office, we didn't have a superhero film, right? Deadpool 2, Deadpool made its money, rather. Mm -hmm. Black Panther made it a, a crap ton of money in February. This is where these dead months are that standard or typical dead months. I think superhero films kind of are the seem to be the only films that can kind of override this stuff. And so uh, I feel like we didn't it, Lego Movie Two didn't really grab people's attention. And Rebel Wars. I hear that's a good decent movie, isn't it romantic? I but I was it's hoping just to see in, that one. Yeah. And you know, given what you're just saying right now, I thought Glass was going to be that right. movie. Yeah, right. But the mixed reviews didn't get it over the hump. And I think also the smaller budget, smaller approach. I didn't think people were necessarily going to blow up over this one because it's not standard superhero fare. And like Superman or Shazam or what have you, uh, so they they I don't I think that's what kind of like maybe kind of knocked against it as well. But over I, I think we're just gonna uh, Captain Marvel is gonna really be where we start to look at what's gonna happen. Of course, uh, How to Train Your Dragon this weekend will be interesting. So, but Captain Marvel is what we're gonna see. If it blows up, then we know people are just waiting for a superhero film. I see what you're saying about the superhero thing, yeah, but yeah. I also do want to point out that a lot of times uh, in recent years it's been genre film, it's been horror mm. that sort mm. of also has blown up. We saw it with Split. We saw it with the first Happy Death Day. We Very saw true. it with Get Out. Yeah. These are early in the year films that so far this year's horror content hasn't brought out that same audience. Yeah. I yeah. mean, even you can look at something like It where horror is filling spots that, you know, we typically assume are dead spots as, right. as far as box office goes. And all of a sudden these horror movies are taking those spots and they're blowing up. So, just not so far this year. Yeah, sadly. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. you know, How to Train Your Dragon should fare pretty well this year. And then yeah. once Captain Marvel comes into the picture, we're almost nonstop. It feels to me, looking at that release date calendar, like summer <laughs> essentially begins in March, well, which that, I got no problem with that. It, and that may be it, that people are just, you know, it's, it's like the in the, in the waves. Just the waiting. waves are put, people are just waiting because they know how much they're going to spend all summer. Because <laughs> it can't even be a strong box office from December. Because last year you had Star Wars, you had Jumanji, you had 
a bunch of great showman which surprised a lot of people and so it wasn't it in december had a strong box office with aquaman and all these other things that were that came out in december so can it be that i think it might be that people are just like kind of waiting for that big thing and then they're gonna go spend their money oh man that's actually really interesting so interesting that i want to pose that to the audience <laughs> how how do you guys feel about that question are you guys waiting to spend your money in the movie theater for so many of these big properties that are coming up do you think that is attributing to the lower numbers of the box office in 2019 thus far i genuinely want to know what you think about that but right now we're moving on to our next story and it is the new trailer for the movie leaving neverland i keep wanting to say finding neverland <laughs> HBO released the first trailer for the two-part documentary, Leaving Neverland, in which two men, Wade Robson and James Safechuck, separately detail, uh, separately detail the sustained abuse they say they suffered at the hands of Michael Jackson. It's a, it's a movie directed by Dan Reed, and in the film, apparently Robson and Safechuck speak in graphic detail about their experience as young boys. The documentary also digs into the long-lasting effects of the abuse, featuring interviews from Robson and, and Safechuck's mother mothers, wives, and siblings to dig into their life experiences following their encounters with Jackson and why it took so long to speak out. Part one of this documentary is airing on HBO on March 3rd, followed by part two on March 4th. So, Haley, I'll start with you on this one. Um, one, were you interested in seeing Leaving Neverland? And two, if you weren't, did this trailer change your mind at all? I will be very honest and say that very depressing documentaries do not tend to be what I am driven towards as a viewer. Um, they're hard to take and I'm a very empathetic, like I'm an empath, I feel your stuff really strongly and they can mess me up for a really long time. So when I started reading the reviews out of Sundance, no, this did not climb to the top of my watch list. Although I, I recognize the importance of these stories being told. Uh, as for the trailer, I think it pretty much looked like what I expected. It looks like it's going to be a really hard movie to watch, uh, possibly a very important film. It's a very complicated subject with a long history, especially with these two figures and the trial and case, and there are no easy answers, no easy things to say about it. I think in that regard, I will force myself to watch it because it feels like an important movie to watch, but I can't say it was something that I was excited for or would naturally be my inclination. For every reason you just mentioned, that's why I didn't see it at Sundance, but I, I do kind of feel obligated to watch it when it comes out, even though... I mean, saying I'm looking forward to it right. couldn't be further from the truth. Roko, yep. where do you stand on this one? Well, actually, this is one of those ones that came out of Sundance that I wish I'd been there to see. So, you know, I would have actually been tried to get into the theater to see this screening because it's a, you know, Michael Jackson was someone that I followed since I was since the 70s and it was into his music or actually, you know, earlier, obviously, with the, the Jackson 5. But like when the change happened, you hear these, heard these rumors coming out over those last few years of his life. And then afterwards, obviously, it was very difficult to consume that possibility because he brought so much joy to so many people and it seemed like one of these people who are permanently you know, the Peter Pan forever type of thing. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the darkness and you see that in this trailer, it really does unsettle you and make you uncomfortable. And I think that's the point. It's to make you think about it a little bit more because we don't have that smoking gun with him, right? We, we're pretty sure on most, on like Singer and Weinstein and all these other people who sexually abused people, but we're not really sure on the Michael Jackson thing. People are on both sides of it, right? There's no real concrete, 100% total evidence. It's up to you to decide how, if you believe it or don't believe it. Because these two gentlemen have some stuff in their past about this whole situation. But then you can say, well, look, they're damaged from the situation. They're going to act a certain way. Stop putting normal behavior on people who've been damaged from sexual abuse as children. So those kinds of things are what you have to navigate. So I hope, if nothing else, I hope this documentary shows us something new. It doesn't have to be a smoking gun, but something new about these stories, both mm -hmm. of these stories. Because judging from the trade, Trailer is very uh, unsettling and uh, overwhelming what you're going to hear and according to some of the interviews it's pretty graphic the description yes. that they go into so if I'm, that may be what needs to be heard by people who are willing to be open-minded about the possibility that Michael Jackson was a child predator or a sexual predator of children and that's a sad thing, and I already see the Michael. I've already seen online since this thing dropped on Sundance the Michael Jackson people defending oh, yeah. massive fans defending Michael Jackson, saying this is all a lie, trying to shame these two gentlemen from telling their stories. So it, it, it's certainly a controversial subject. I, yeah, 
I do want to touch on what you mentioned, mm. which is that it is said to be extremely graphic. Yeah. And as well, you and I both indicated that we feel some sort of obligation to watch it. And I do just want to say, like, if you don't feel at a place in your life where that's the kind of stuff you can hear or watch, sure. don't feel an obligation to watch this kind of movie. Like, mm. take care of yourself. I know that we all want to be a part of the story and, and be informed, but take care of yourself as a viewer and as a person. Sure. A very, very important thing to put out there. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, we are going to move on to our next topic, but before we do, I've got to remind you about some content you're going to get to see right here on Collider. And first is something that's already up and running. We have a brand new episode of For Your Consideration. So if you're busy filling out your Oscar ballots right now and you want to win your pool, that is the episode to watch because that's where we file our <laughs> final semi-final <laughs> prediction so go use this as your cheat sheet and then tune in on oscar night sunday the 24th we are going to have a pre-show before the actual ceremony here with the whole fyc crew where we are actually going to set in stone those final predictions although i don't see too many changing between now and then after that wraps up we have the live stream that will go on the entire oscar ceremony where we will chime in on all the winners how how the no host thing is going you name it we'll talk about it all and then after the oscars we will be back here with the fyc crew to do a wrap-up give our thoughts on what wins best picture it's going to be quite the night so as you prepare for that i'm going to toss it to uh Haley fouch to talk about what we had going on on the witching hour this week yeah, we had a really fun guest this week. Um, we sort of dug into A24 Horror, our favorites, and we welcomed the writer and director of The Hole in the Ground, Mr. Lee Cronin, and he was just a blast to have. It was a really good, wide-ranging conversation, and I highly recommend you check it out. He is super cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty biased. I highly recommend you always check it out, but well, he was yeah. a really fun guest. He, he really was, and I, I genuinely really did love uh, Hole in the Ground. Now we are going to move on to that third story, and this is a new featurette for Rocket Man. It's a new behind-the-scenes piece, and it basically allows us to watch Taron Egerton doing a rendition of Tiny Dancer. This movie, of course, is directed by Dexter Fletcher, and it's hit in theaters on May 31st. So, Roka, it's interesting mm. getting this featurette this week when we have Bohemian Rhapsody up for Best Picture and some other awards too because we've all been talking, you know, Taron Egerton sings in this movie, Rami Malek didn't really sing in that movie, then also there's the connection with Dexter Fletcher mm. so just with all the comparisons between the two on your mind does this make you look forward to Rocketman even more than maybe you were looking forward to Bohemian Rhapsody? Oh yeah, I, I love the Elton John story in on so many levels and so for me I'm very much looking forward to this and Taron Egerton is an actor obviously we've all been watching for a little bit of time since the Kingsman movies but you look at uh, uh, Eddie the Eagle so good in that as well and then you throw this into uh, the mix here with and I'm just excited to see what he can do with this he certainly has the look for uh, Elton John of that time in the 70s the flamboyant costumes looks like the costume design is incredible in this movie Okay, and Dexter Fletcher, fantastic. I can't wait to see what he does with it. You know, obviously, if you remember him from Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, kind of crazy that he's a director now. Uh, and and so is uh, Matthew. Oh, I forget the other actor's name who's in that as well. He's a director now as well. But I you, don't think anyone heard anything you just said because you teed up a big yeah. fat butt. <laughs> oh, yeah. But and? that being said... I do not like his voice for this. I know I hate being I hate being the person who's not like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. I just don't think he's capturing what Elton brought. The thing that Elton made the separation was he wasn't a tra he wasn't like this one of those like trained Broadway voices, and you can hear that with Taron. Whereas his was more soulful, Elton's was more soulful, and I think that's kind of missing from this. But other than that, everything else about this clip is exciting, and I can't wait to see this movie. And I champion Dexter Fletcher directing music biopics till the day he dies. <laughs> so I'm excited for this overall. It just still made me excited. Even though, man, I've liked his voice, still made me excited. Wow, okay. I had a yeah. reaction to that. Did you? <laughs> yeah, of course. Did I you? thought I liked his voice. Okay. I think it sounds really good. Uh, and I do personally prefer that, even if you don't think it sounds 100% to the lip syncing. Oh, absolutely. I, I would, yep. I think that's, uh, for me, that's the more cohesive, bolder performance to give. And mm -hmm. I'm very excited to see. I, I, I don't know. I dug it. And I, I, I'm excited to see Taryn and Dexter Fletcher reteam because I really like Eddie the mm -hmm. Eagle. Mm -hmm. I think they're a nice combination. I am not the world's biggest Bohemian Rhapsody fan, so um, <laughs> I am excited to see him do one that's his 
from start to finish. Yeah, you can add me to the Eddie the Eagle fandom that's yeah. happening right here. That was actually one of my favorite movies of the year, the year it came out. I really walked out of that one feeling like I was floating or something. I adored that movie. But it's not necessarily the fact that he's singing, even though I really do like how he sounds in this. But that's not what wowed me about this. I feel like the part, the magic of this piece that really got me caught up in it was just how passionate he spoke mm -hmm. about being able to play Elton John and having this opportunity because I know leading up to a movie is released, everyone's always going to say something along those lines, but I feel like you can kind of hear the truth in everything he speaks. And I feel like that feeling was more infectious than, I mean, maybe even the, the other material that we've seen from the movie thus far, I tend to find that that kind of promotional tool works best on me at least. I get that. I mean, you want... It, when you love these public figures as much as we do, you want creatives behind it mm -hmm. who feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, it does seem like that is uh, that's the case here, and that's mm -hmm. that's heartening. And, and you're getting a lot of love for uh, Bernie Taupin, which is nice. So Jimmy Bell playing him, and then Richard Madden showing up. I like Richard Madden showing mm -hmm. up. So the more screen time we get with him as he goes towards being Batman would be great. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought oh he was going to be Bond. <laughs> oh, yeah, Bond. That's right. Did you purposely hand me that transition? Maybe. Because that was mighty convenient, because our next story is all about <laughs> Batman. So you might have heard a certain rumor circulating around out there that Army Hammer not only could possibly be the next Batman, but people were reporting that he was in final negotiations to take the role. And then uh, that rumor was quickly debunked by Boris Kipp from THR and Justin Kroll from Variety. And Army Hammer even told told Yahoo UK this. No one who can actually give me the job has asked me if I'm interested. I don't even know if they've done. I think they're still working on a script. I don't think that they're close to production, but I conclusively, but I can conclusively tell you that no one has checked my availability, which is a bummer. Now we know the Batman is due to hit theaters on June 25th, 2021. But before we get there, we do have to make some casting happen. So even though this was completely debunked, just to have a little fun with the thought, Haley, what what would you say if one day we do find out Army Hammer really is playing Batman? I just like put together that that's right before my birthday. So my birthday is just going to be pure Batman that year. It's just going to be chaos. Uh, aside from that, I really, I've said before, I really like Army Hammer for Batman. I think he's like, you know, that's why he got the role in George Miller's movie a million years ago and why he's continued to stay in the casting rumors all these years because he's kind of a perfect pick for it. I love that. However... I don't know, ever since whatever online genius came up with Robert Pattinson, I kind of haven't recovered mm. from that. Oh, you want to fight about it, I can see that. That's <laughs> cool. Really, <laughs> I respect you too much. <laughs> I, I really like that, and I, I do like the idea of something really unexpected like that, as opposed to, mm. you know, everybody's kind of like, yeah, Army Hammer would be great, Jake Gyllenhaal would be great, but I do like something a little off the beaten path that still most people are going, oh my God, that's kind of brilliant. I keep leaning towards the no-name uh, mm -hmm. route for this and then filling that ensemble out with people who are more, you know, famous names, famous faces, whatnot. But now that you say you say that, I think that's what I want more than anything, or at least that's what I'm feeling right now, because we're constantly <laughs> talking about it and there's so many names between Army Hammer, Robert Pattinson, Oscar Isaac that are just circulating constantly that I think all I want right now is a pleasant surprise. Not that yeah. I'm against any of those getting the role necessarily, but it's nice to get a surprise. <laughs> It, it would be nice. I don't. I don't think there's any realistic chance that it'll go to a thorough unknown. I think we might see something like Gal Gadot, where she was not really that well known, but she yeah. had been in the Fast and Furious mm -hmm. franchise. She was a name. We might see something like that. I don't think they're gonna just cast someone straight off of Broadway. Oh, so, that might be a good. Well, call. Yeah, we could get like another Daisy Ridley situation out of it. Who knows? Mm. We could. I don't know. <laughs> you don't. <agree. laughs> I, I don't think so. But it's, it's possible. Where do you stand on all this? Roka, are you bracing yourself for more reports like this surfacing before we get something legit and concrete? Oh, sure. I mean, on the heels of what happened last week and you add this, like, uh, the sites are going to take their chances. They want to get known. They want to get clicks. They want to get seen. And so they do, the, I, do I think it's responsible? No. But we're definitely going to, you asked the question, do I think we'll see more of this? Yes, absolutely. We see speculation, whatever. But ironically, I think this starts to move the needle towards Army Hammer doing it even more so than before because he didn't have to comment on it. 
he decided to comment on it. That says something. When he says, what a bummer, that tells you his interest is there. And if anybody's listening, his interest is there. And so I wonder if that changes the perception of it all or if they've been having negotiations or conversations behind the scenes. We see this all the time. People denying, denying, denying. All of a sudden, they, they, are, the, they are the person. And so I don't know how it's going to go down. I hear what you're saying, Perry, about a no name. I see it. I could see that. I still like, uh, uh, what's his face, Dornan? Is that the one from the Jamie Fifty Shades? Dornan? Yeah, I still like Jay Man. I know some people are uh, you know, in and out about his acting mm. ability, but you look at ARMY, I wouldn't have bought ARMY until I saw Sorry to Bother You. That's when I changed <laughs> about ARMY. I liked ARMY, I thought he was great in Social Network. I thought he was good in Man From U.N.C.L.E. That's a quietly damn good film between, yes, and having him and Henry Cavill be at it again if they keep Cavill as Superman would be interesting. Somebody threw out the possibility of Chalamet as Robin. Call me by your name, Batman and Robin, would be a very interesting situation I saw that tweet, all I think. the way around. So I don't um, think I can ever say no to that. Tickets. Both for me. Wait. So I, I, I like the idea of Army Hammer. I'm coming around on it. We'll see about his hair, but I'm coming around. He's got the jaw. He's got the look. Can he convey? the complexity of Bruce Wayne that's going to separate him from Christian Bale or separate him from uh, from uh, uh, Michael Keaton or separate him from uh, 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 Affleck. We'll see. This doesn't necessarily answer that question, mm. but I have on my mind right now because I saw it at Sundance's new movie, Wounds, and I didn't love the movie overall, uh -huh. but I think that's further proof that he is... One, an excellent actor, but even better than I think the industry in general gives him credit for, mm -hmm. because that was something where I think he completely stepped out and ste uh, not even out, but stepped beyond anything that I've seen from him before. And that gives me confidence should this circle back around mm -hmm. and turn out to be true. But but who knows? I mean, one of the big takeaways from a story like this is just the importance of you know, really taking a lot of these rumors with a grain of salt. There's certain outlets out there that are going to be more reliable in terms of reporting the truth. And when we do see those outlets report things like that, that's when we're going to bring it to you. But if there's an outlet that let's say we don't know, there's no reason to think, oh, that has to be a lie because we don't know them. But that just calls for a certain amount of vetting. So if you see a rumor pop up out there and you don't really know about it, just wait until someone confirms the truth or not. So we will see how all of this shakes out because, you know, 2021 does seem like a long ways away. But I imagine I would like to bet that they cast this role sooner rather than later to start to get things going. Are, are you guys in agreement on that? Absolutely. They're also, I would imagine, want to give the actor time to get, like, bat buff. <laughs> like, you have to get superhero <laughs> buff for a superhero movie. Oh, that bat actually buff. takes time? <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. Okay. You okay. tell me, Miss Cross. <laughs> I am buff. definitely not bat, bat, bat woman buff. Yeah. No, that's never happening. Bat ever, ever, ever. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um... Oh, are you going to weigh to be sir It has to be soon, don't <laughs> yeah. you think? Just to calm all these all these rumors down, it has to be soon, I feel like. Because this I, is just going to reach a fever pitch over the summer, and it's going to overwhelm everything. And I just think we just got to make make the decision already. And the Cavill, too. They need to make that decision be done with it already. I, I just thought don't you were going to give us a bat buff timeline for Oh, that. bat buff, yeah. <laughs> this new workout from Perry Nemiroff, bat buff, uh, 1995. It'd be perfect. Oh. I'm down with that. Vintage. Yeah, yeah. really. Nice. Going all Vintage. the way back to sleepaway camp days. That's where I worked out. <laughs> Out and learned how to get bat buff. <laughs> that sounds freaking weird. All right, mm. I've got no transition for this one. We've got one more big topic to hit today. A little controversy on this one. So there, of course, was the controversial hiring of former Pixar and Walt Disney animation head John Lasseter to spearhead Skydance Animation. And that decision has resulted in a pretty big departure for one of their upcoming films. So Emma Thompson has quietly exited her voice role in the upcoming Skydance film Luck, and it is reportedly over concerns about working with Lassiter. So Roka, mm. I do interpret this as a sign for more departures and more problems for Skydance to come over this hiring decision. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I think we said this uh, a few weeks ago when this was first was announced. I was on the set when, when the, he got the thing asked, and I said, it's going to lead to people leaving because, you know, in this time now with Time's Up and Me Too, like people got to 
stand behind their words. It isn't like the old days where people are like, oh, Woody, I don't know. I haven't found anything about Woody. I don't know. I'm still going to go work with him. Now, all of a sudden, people find their guts and they're not going to do Woody Allen projects or they're donating their salaries. Well, now's the time to step up. Emma does. And Emma's been a class act for years, for decades. She follows. She's very strong in her opinion. She's very, she follows her opinion. She's got a very strong moral code. And I respect that about her. And she does what she does. Now, this is a sample. She didn't, have to, she didn't make a big stink out of it. She quietly left the project. You know what? Not for me as long as he's involved i'm out people can do that without making big histrionic or big loud noises or anything like that walk out of projects and i think you gotta if you're gonna say time's up you gotta act like time's up and get out of these projects because you don't approve of this man being in charge of this stuff and skydance can can hire as many women as they want to shield john lasseter to make it a p less of a pr8 i think it's i think it's terrible and i i hope more actors walk away from this and prove that this time is really over and this kind of behavior is done for actors to be part of or, or, or support. That hiring was hands down one of the most upsetting and disappointing sure. news stories I had seen in a long, long time. And the fact that Emma Thompson took this opportunity to say, okay, I'm just this isn't for me, not going to do it, is such an important move to make because had, let's say, she not set that precedent and maybe made others feel comfortable in making the same move, then all of a sudden you start to send this signal that what was done at another company is is okay. And then in the future, maybe less companies would p feel compelled to investigate certain allegations and deal with them appropriately. And yeah. the fact that she stood up and did this, and really, I'm kind of hoping that this leads to more walkouts on the studio. I, I think that's probably a positive thing for the industry overall. So, Haley, the way I'm going to spin this for you now is what do you think Skydance needs to do in order to fix the situation? Or is is there an unremovable blemish because they made this choice to hire him at all? Super low-key question. Uh, <laughs> I'm good at that. I, I will be your counselor, Skydance. No, I think that they, uh, they're going to have to deal with this as long as Lasseter is there. That's like... I, I don't know if it's a permanent blemish on the company forever and ever and ever and ever, but as long as he's overseeing things, you're going to get people like Emma Thompson who just aren't going to be a part of it. And she's, I don't, like, they had to have known that was coming. She is one of the boldest, proudest feminist voices for decades. There's no way she was going to stand for that. And I love her. But it, it's... I think taken with what happened to Red Sonia, it is sort of a sign mm -hmm. that people are like, uh, no, we're not done having this conversation and you can't just immediately say everything's okay with these people again while investigations are still going on. While this is still being hashed out, it's way too soon. They are not just clear to go back as if nothing ever happened. I still can't quite understand it. I I read a Money. I was reading one Money. article yeah. that uh, yeah. Okay. It's but, money. That's all it, it is. But even if you take the money approach and you say, oh, Skydance, let's say, wants to be the mm -hmm. next Pixar, so we're going to scoop him up after he yeah. left that company with all, even with all these allegations. Yeah. How, how do you not process the fact that that's going to come with a significant amount of blowback that you, you will wind up with not only no gain from, mm -hmm. but you will backpedal significantly for making that decision at all? I think because in decades past, it hasn't. Right. In decades past, there hasn't been the blowback that you think and oh, that you, you were anticipating. This is new ground now in 2019, 2018, carry over. Like, it's new ground. So we'll see what the blowback is. Emma Thompson is a notable person to step away. It's when someone who is a current A-list selling out millions of dollars and or billions of dollars at the box office, when that uh, actress or actor walks away because they don't want to work with Lasseter, that's a louder noise. And as that noise, noise gets louder and louder, then Skydance will make the move and they'll feel the blowback for real. But in decades past, studios have done this over, I mean, Woody made a whole decade, three decades of work out of this, like denying all this stuff. So, you know, you see studios not doing it. So we'll see now if it does blow back, Perry, but it's a legitimate point you make the question is will it have a blowback we'll see as it goes along well this seems like step one to that yeah the other thing and I, I think you know we've been doing this for a while and I've interviewed a lot of female directors female writers over the years before me too and before time's up and asking them about the dynamics in Hollywood and how what it would take for that to change 
Uh, they did, obviously couldn't have seen Me Too and Time's Upcoming, but right. the thing they repeated every single female creative was that they don't have a lot of power anyway, whether they're producers, directors. It's all these same small group of guys at the very top who have all the money, who make all the decisions. And in the past, they've, as Roka was just saying, they've been able to really hold on to that power very tightly and make those decisions. But now that something like Me Too Time's Up comes along that nobody could have predicted, it changes the rules. It changes the game. I think another thing to look at, too, is where's the public's role in this? If the public is still going to these movies, produced, right. directed, written, or whatever, by these people, then the studio, those small studios you're talking about, the people are like, well, see, it didn't cost us anything. They still came and watched the movie. So th there's a, there's a, uh, to me, there's a, uh, there has to be two parts of this component. It's the creatives and the public. If they both walk away from a situation because of a decision, then we got something that really is, is a sea change. A very, a very fair point. I mean, mm. we're, we're not just talking about putting a Band-Aid on a situation. Yeah. We're talking right. about long-lasting change. And I'm a firm believer that in order to make that happen, yes, it is a bunch of baby steps forward, maybe a couple of steps back, and then fixing it again. But it's, it's all of us. It's mm. not just the people in Hollywood making the movies. It's movie lovers across the board. And if we all kind of come together and take those responsibilities... High hopes that long-term change will be real. Mm. All right. Before we jump into these live Twitter questions, which you can keep sending in if you'd like, got a whole bunch of plugs to tell you about. And you know what? Let's make John Roca first on the list. What? How about a little sports time <laughs> talk oh. right now? What's going on in the show? Yeah, yeah. Sports time. Yesterday we dropped a new episode. Jay Washington, the Urban Gladiator, joined me and Matt Nose, talked a bunch, bunch, bunch of stuff. Antonio Brown, Colin Kaepernick, Kareem Hunt, uh, some LeBron conversation as well. And we answered questions from the fans. And uh, Jack Hyde and I did our new episode of Collider, English Premier League, Collider EP talking about all the latest news from the world of English Premier League soccer transfers and rumors and all that jazz. So there you go. And Josh McCuga will take over for me this week and next on Sports Time. So look out for his episodes on Fridays and next Monday. He At this point, we have Holly Saunders booked as a guest. So tune in for that. Good stuff right there. And more stuff to stay tuned for. We have a new episode of Rule of Two dropping tonight. So keep an eye out for that. And Collider Live is tomorrow. We have Heroes tomorrow. We have a new episode of Movie Talk tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow, but a little extra something you could expect to see on this channel tonight there might be a Captain Marvel screening and I might be attending it with Amy Dallin and you might get Twitter reactions by the end of the night and then you also might get a whole wrap up video of all the Twitter reactions that come out of this screening so stay tuned we have Dennis and Dorian kind of manning the ship on this effort and they are going to bring you all the tweets as the screening wraps up all right, it's live Twitter questions right now, and my first one here is from Eva the Jedi, who asks, have you ever regretted seeing a movie? For example, one that really offended you or a sequel that changed how you feel about the first movie? I'll give you guys a quick second, because the second half of that question just leads me right down the path back to Independence Day Resurgence. Oh, boy. That, that makes me want to, like, pound my fist on this desk so badly. I think, you know... That might have been the first situation I ever encountered where a sequel so, so drastically affected how I looked at the original. And it's so upsetting to me. I feel like any other time a sequel disappointed, maybe I've been able to like block it out, compartmentalize, whatever. I can't watch <laughs> Independence Day anymore without thinking about what happens to some of those characters. That's the same for me. That totally, like, the second part of the question, that's the one. I'm in the exact same boat. The first one, not so much. I don't get offended very easily, and I don't can't imagine any movie would offend me that much, pretty much ever. But there have been things that have made me feel so bad mm. that I kind of regret it, along the same lines of, like, we were talking about the HBO documentary. Oh, yeah. uh, like, I'm not, I don't regret having watched Dear Zachary, because it's a very like, good documentary, but it super destroyed a piece of me, and that's never coming back. So I, I take it neither Ooh. of you have seen it, because no. otherwise nope. you'd be reacting. Wow. Nope. Uh, so I, yeah, I that now. one is probably, <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal, but it really does take something from you. Mm. So those are the movies that would be the closest to what like didn't offend me, but that I wish maybe hadn't been in my brain. Okay. Uh, I can't agree with Resurgence. 
I like that movie. Uh, of course. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> we know. We've we know. had this battle for <laughs> since that movie came out. Fun popcorn flick. And the first one wasn't that good, for God's sake. It was a classic. It was a fun throwaway sci fi film, um, in my opinion. So here's what I'll You're say. You're a fun throwaway sci fi <laughs> film. <laughs> Damn right I am. I don't know what you'd call me, though. Uh, what would be. Uh, I guess. Well, I would, I'm tempted to say Reloaded and Revolutions, but I still enjoy mm. Matrix. I'm tempted to say Batman vs. Superman, but I still enjoy Man of Steel. Uh, I think for me, uh, I, I don't know if I can answer that second question because I, I, I've always retained the love of the original no matter what happens in the sequels. Um, but I will say the film that I, Nymphomaniac is the film that I wish I'd never saw, <laughs> volume one and two. I wish I'd never been asked to watch that for uh, to cover it early on in this business. And it was the worst experience of my I just I got it and I didn't want it and so let's make that clear I got it I just didn't want it and so when I was watching I was like going insane banging my head against the wall having to watch this shit I love the idea of seeing that as a poll quote on the poster <laughs> I got it but I didn't want it <laughs> I feel like that would be a great selling that'd probably the only way I'd get on a poll quote for a poster <laughs> alright we've got another question here that a number of you have sent in but I picked one from Alessio Pasquale and Alessio asks for tonight's Collider Movie Talk question what do you think of the controversy surrounding trolls downvoting captain marvel and rotten tomatoes over bad comments over cons, excuse me over comments made by brie larson so where where do you guys stand on all this i saw a couple of uh, headlines uh, swirling around today mm -hmm. and uh yeah it goes without saying it, it makes me super sad that that's happening it's like it's gonna happen now, right? Yeah, this is the thing it's, now. It's just every time there's a movie that somebody doesn't agree with the politics of the film or its star or whatever, there's gonna be these organized campaigns online to sort of disparage the movie. But we saw that didn't really work. <laughs> like, uh, Black Panther made a whole butt ton mm -hmm. of money. It doesn't matter if you went ahead of time and downvoted it and tried to give mm -hmm. it a bad rap in advance. I just think it's par for the course now. It's It sucks. Yeah. It's like, it's super goofy. I think they should be outed. Every single one of those accounts should be outed. I think they should. They, uh, I think the services should be uh, allowed to publish their names and allowed to say, "Hey, these are the people downvoting the Captain Marvel film before even seeing it." I got no problem. You go see it, and you still hate it. You had an agenda narrative, whatever. It's a free country. Go see. You got a freedom of speech. To to start downvoting it or trying to destroy it before you've even seen it because you got because your feelings got hurt by what she said you need to grow the fuck up like honestly I'm sorry I don't want to get us struck but you need to grow the hell up and that's a ridiculous thing to me overall because people work really hard to create this art and for you to just because of your pugnacious nature or your inability to grow up uh, or or deal with someone having a different point of view go, and go after this person because she's trying to speak for equality because you can't understand the nuance of her point of view and you want to black and white her rather than understand that she's being very nuanced in how she's presenting the situation God forbid more people get a piece of the pie God forbid more people have access to play these roles or be part of these productions who are of color or, 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 or women or whatever God forbid that's all she spoke about and that's how change happens and I hate to break it to you your ability to do that comes from someone who wanted to change and may give you the right to have freedom of speech in this world so you're being ignorant about your own history of what you're able to do here yeah uh that was that yeah, was a uh, very that well said had, there. like uh, i don't know like a metal <laughs> riff behind it it was good i don't know i do like uh, yeah i kind of like that visual now um, i want their names is what i'm saying i, uh, <laughs> I think that it is kind of par for the course which is incredibly frustrating it almost feels like we can do nothing about it but i do think there's a little something that can be done about it and maybe it's to get rid of these these interested in tools tools that give mm. people access to sure. expressing opinion quite like that at least because i do think there's obviously great value and i mean it's what we do every day we talk about whether or not we're super interested in mm. something it's when that talk becomes hateful that we need to remove some of those tools until i don't know maybe this just naturally goes away by itself or figure out a different tool where you can control a little bit of that hate speech because 
I, I don't care if we're talking about a Rotten Tomatoes interest meter or Twitter or Instagram, comments on Facebook, you name it. There's just, there's no place. There's no place and there's no need for any of this. So I think any step that any internet outlet out there can do to make some of that go away is only going to make this world and this industry a better place. So we need to start figuring out what the tactics are to making that happen, especially if this is something that is going to continue to be par for the course for a while. But you know what? If you're out there and if you're interested in Captain Marvel, don't let any of that hate deter you from going to see it. Just block it out. Doesn't matter anyway. Hopefully you enjoy it. If you don't, no big deal. Just express yourself appropriately and be kind to anybody you talk about these movies with because there's no point in doing it otherwise. All right. We're going to do one more question a little on a lighter note. How about this? Okay. Jonathan Caro is asking, Pretend you're playing a video game, except it's a series of characters from action movies. If you were to select a character, who would it be? What characters would you fight against? And what stage from an action film? Jesus Whoa! Christ. Whoa! Um, I feel like this is uh, this is really challenging our creative brains yeah. right now. Um, so, all right, a great question. Should, isn't it a great question? I love this visual too. Yes. Break it down again. Action hero, who they're fighting against? I'll and... tell you what my stage is. Okay. I think my stage would be would be like the Donkey Kong stage, like the old <laughs> old school arcade with the ladders. Oh. That's my stage. Okay. So I've gotten that far. I got that. <laughs> so we're playing a video game, yes, right? We're playing a video game. Okay. Uh, I always, I don't know. I just grew up the biggest JCVD fan, so yeah. I would nice. I would probably want him as my avatar. Was he kicks so pretty, such clean lines. It's almost <laughs> like dance. Uh, you want the cookie? Yeah. Okay, so Haley's uh, taking but one step. More <laughs> coherent than when he was on Collider Live. You want some milk? <laughs> what do you got, oh, Roka? Oh God, sorry. Chime yeah, in, chime on. in. Oh, we're going one at a time. Yeah. Remember the old school legend? <laughs> Follow along, Roka. Remember the old school James Bond first shooter once? Yeah. Yeah. John Wick, first oh, shooter, nice. James Bond, fighting those people in that. Like that's, GoldenEye. Like GoldenEye, I that's the stage. I was obsessed with GoldenEye. People were insane for those James Bond first person shooter games. Oh, yeah. I played a lot of that. So John Wick doing that would be, that would be my choice. This is a very good call for something they should actually probably be making. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think if I could play as a character, so a video game, a series of, uh, all right, the character's from an action movie, not a mm. video game. I think I might go with, I think I might go with, I'm debating between, because they're on my mind right now, uh, Angelina Jolie's Tomb Raider. Oh, Even yeah. more so than Alicia Vikander's, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, or Mila Jovovich, but only Mila Jovovich from the first Resident Evil. Okay. I don't like any of the other movies. <laughs> but then again, it's like all the other movies that came after the first one are the more action-heavy ones where she kicks even more ass. So I feel like I would be putting myself at a disadvantage, but I think I'm just taking his question too seriously. <laughs> I, I'm enjoying it. Have some it. fun, Perry. I also like to take my, my suggestion further i would like to see the martial like the greatest on-screen martial artists get their own street fighter style game <laughs> <laughs> so it's like bruce lee versus jcvd or oh, all these yeah. that's a genius idea that i can't believe is not a real really? game i mean thank you for calling me a genius <laughs> but i happen to agree well on the ufc game you can fight as bruce lee against these other fighters and nice. mma fighters so that's i think that's the closest they've come to something like that uh, so that's a, that's a great suggestion what about tomb raider in frogger what about tomb raider playing frogger <laughs> or pitfall I, harry pitfall Harry. remember i the, loved frog clearly right? i have things with games where you like scoot like across yep. up and down something i loved frogger but tomb yeah. raider and frogger sounds interesting but the bad guys i would want to fight i think mm. i'd have to pick the uh the foot soldiers from uh from teenage mutant ninja turtles just because uh, yeah. i think i'd have a hard time fighting a non-masked thing <laughs> you know like when they're faceless you care a little less i'm always for fighting nazis <laughs> oh that's, oh, that's always go. good just ask indiana jones <laughs> have we all filled in all three blanks at this point i think so okay yeah. you didn't well, say who you want to fight oh you just said john the nazis the nazis no, all no, right no wait the people who downturn Captain Marvel before they see <laughs> all right. it. Fight them all and kill them all. Joe now King, that Joe. we've settled that, oh boy. I mean, John Wick, John Wick. <laughs> all right. We're closing out this episode. A huge thanks to everyone who sent in those mighty fine Twitter questions. Mm -hmm. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Haley, Roku, you guys rock. Adam in the booth, you know how cool you are. You are the best. 
Thank you guys so much for tuning in for this episode of Collider. Movie Talk, as always, like and share it. Tell everybody you know about Movie Talk and all the other wonderful things we've got coming your way on Collider Video and across the whole Collider Network. Tune in tomorrow, live, 4 p.m. PT, for a brand new episode of Movie Talk.